I am Bev Hackmeister, and I am serving as moderator for our very first ever town hall meeting for CASA, for Advocates for Children. We are so excited for all of you to be here. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I have been a volunteer with Advocates for Children since 05. I came into Advocates for Children because of a friend that told me about the work that Advocates does. And it just hit something in me and I knew this was something I wanted to learn more about and get involved in. And boy, was I right. I have handled about 10 cases over the past 15 years. And uh, those cases, some of them have been shared with a co-CASA, uh, Cindy Reed, if any of you know her. And we have purposefully taken on some of the more difficult and larger cases, which has been challenging and rewarding all at the same time. Um, I served on the CASA board for, gosh, I wanna say three years. Uh, my husband and I sponsored the CASA golf tournament uh, for six years through JHL Constructors. So I've had a lot of um, intimate involvement with CASA and have loved every single part of it. It is just the most amazingly run organization and the good that is done is just beyond words. Uh, we have a huge variety of people joining us tonight. We have volunteers, we have donors, we have staff members, we have community partners. So there is a varying level of uh, knowledge about what we do and the intricacies of Advocates for Children, as well as experience. I'm sure we have some uh, volunteers who probably have either just taken a case or are waiting to take a case. So what we're hoping is that you will learn something tonight that you didn't know before, that you will come away with some deeper knowledge of Advocates for Children and what we do. We want you to ask questions. There is a chat box at the bottom of your screen. And if you think of questions as our meeting goes on, please type those in and we're gonna answer as many of them as we can at the end of our discussion. Uh, the purpose of this town hall meeting, the very first one, is obviously to address COVID and how that has affected advocates for children, how it has affected our kids, our families, and how we have responded to that, which I have to say has been incredibly amazing. And you're gonna hear more about that as we go on. Uh, we want to share how needs have been met and we wanna share with this network that we have with us tonight, what our focus is for the remainder of 2020. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I'd like to introduce our guests. We have Josefina Milliner. She is our executive director, yay. And we have Amy Reese, our COO, and Andrea Takau, our Director of Development and Community Relations. Thank you all <clears throat> for being here and for filling all of us in on the amazing things that Advocates has stepped up to the plate to do this year and what the future looks like. I don't know how many of you realize the large area that Advocates for Children serves. We serve an area that is close to the size of Connecticut. We serve Arapahoe, Douglas, Elbert, and Lincoln counties. That is huge. And you can well imagine how diverse the communities are across that district. Uh, overall, the first question I'd like to ask is, how are our CASA kids doing? And how are the families holding up? 
Beth, thanks for also joining us tonight. You always step up exactly when we need you. And so we appreciate you bringing some life to our town hall also. Um, and thanks for asking these questions and, and kind of moderating this evening. I think the information that we wanna to share tonight is so important. And when I looked last at the attendees, we had 64 attendees, which is just mm -hmm. speaks to our continued outpour of support from our community. And I'm so thankful. So on behalf of my team, um, and my board and all of the children we serve. I also just wanna start by saying thank you um, to everybody who took the time tonight to join us. Um, as far as your question goes, I think you hit the nail on the head of just the area that we cover is so vast and it has so many differences. We have rural and suburban and uh, we've always known that there were differences that exist in those, uh, this large area. I think what COVID did is it highlighted those differences for us. Um, and just imagine here we are almost eight months down the road um, from when all of this kind of impacted our community and we're still here and adapting. And as adults, we're still trying to put our head around what this means. Um, so imagine being a child who's already stuck in a very complicated child welfare system um, at no fault of their own, trying to figure this out in isolation. Essentially what happened back in March is our kids went from having a safety net of teachers and coaches and social workers at home to being isolated in the very home sometimes that they had, had gone through some of their abuse. And, um, and we had to adapt overnight. Parenting visits stopped. Um, we had um, adopt adoptions that were postponed. Uh, we had hearings that were canceled. And we all, as community partners and as CASA, had to shift and figure out how we could still continue to be there for our kids but in a distant way. Um, we know how important that connections are when you're facing challenging times. And I was so just overwhelmed by the way that our volunteers stepped up and they adapted very quickly overnight. Uh, what we saw is that without those safety nets of school in place, um, our calls to the hotline went down. And so we lost that ability for early intervention. Many times our mandated reporters are able to see things at school or um, at after school extracurricular activities and we're able to get in early and help provide some support before things escalate to the point of needing a dependency and neglect case be opened. Um, but without that in place, the cases that we saw come in during the um, stay at home orders were some of the most egregious cases. They were cases from domestic violence calls. They were cases where kids were ending up in the hospital. Um, and so we lost the ability for early intervention, but our volunteers never stopped showing up for those cases that we are currently involved in. We did adoption parades. They dropped meals off on doorsteps. Um, our team got very um, creative about how we could get involved and help support our families. Uh, Andrea um, is planning on talking a little bit about that as well. And then we, we just wanted to make sure that people knew that even though we were in isolation, we're still here and we've continued to show up. And more importantly, our volunteers have continued to show up. Um, and so we're, we're happy to be able to share a lot of the things that we've been able to do over the last several months and that we continue to adapt as the holidays approach. Things are gonna continue to um, need some adapting. And, and so we're eager to talk to all of you about what that looks like over the next couple of months. That's awesome. What does it look like these days for CASA kids and how they are managing? Well, I think uh, to start, school is such a big piece of what it means to be a CASA kid right now. Mm -hmm. um, as so many on this call can probably relate to, back in March when our kids were sent home and were then um, kind of forced to do online school overnight, we were met with a lot of challenges. We had families who didn't have the Wi-Fi bandwidth to handle both online school and parents or caregivers working from home. We had some families that didn't have Wi-Fi at all. Uh, we had others that were not, they didn't have a laptop or a tablet in the home. So the kids physically had no way of participating in their online school. Um, so with that challenge in particular, we had a wonderful volunteer and a board member who both reached out to their personal networks to solicit a ton of gently used laptops that we were then able to distribute to kids. So that was really wonderful. <clears throat> Fast forward to this semester and <laughs> there's a lot going on. Um, within the district that we serve, Arapahoe, Douglas, Albert, Lincoln, we have over a dozen different school districts and everybody's doing things a little bit differently. 
Um, we have some kids that are all remote, some kids that are in some version of a hybrid model. And again, like many on this call, I think for the most part, our families are, are making the most of what they can with a less than ideal situation. Uh, what we're really concerned about is the fact that within those four counties, we have hundreds of children who are not enrolled in school and we don't know where they are. Um, and this is for a variety of reasons and not all of them are super sinister. Um, for example, my mom is a registrar at a local elementary school. And over the last several months, she has fielded tons of phone calls from confused parents. Um, and I'm even watching the chat box right now and there's technical difficulties and it's just, things are just hard and confusing. And so some mm -hmm. of those kids might be um, not enrolled because of confusion and parents just not knowing where to start. Um, but we do fear that there are other kids that do have some really concerning and scary situations going on, perhaps in homes where a parent or caregiver doesn't want to turn on the webcam because they're concerned about the condition of their home and what teachers might see. Um, in other situations, we're afraid that we probably have some parents who are struggling with drug or alcohol use and are not in a place to get their kids on um, on Zoom every morning or on whatever whatever digital online school looks like. So there's a lot that is up in the air, but overall we're, we're most concerned about those kids that we're just not hearing from right now. Mm. Uh, two comments. Uh, one is the computers that were handed out. What a blessing that was to so many kids. I know one of my own CASA kiddos benefited from that and it was, it was a lifesaver. They were, the family was so incredibly appreciative of getting that gently used computer because otherwise he would not have had one. Mm. And the other thing is, uh, I wanted to talk just a minute about COVID connections uh, that was set up in April and is still up and running, correct? It sure is, yep. So, uh, CASA COVID Connections was one of our campaigns that we rolled out in April to try to help with some of these challenges that we were hearing from families. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a way for donors to directly support needs and challenges that had arisen with our families and kids because of COVID. So donors mm -hmm. contributed to a campaign that we then used to help um, help pay utility bills and portions of rent and another grocery run for the week mm -hmm. and things that families just were not able to take on early on. Mm -hmm. So yes, it is still, thank you for bringing that up, Bev. It is still up on our site, um, on our website. You can go find it and you can still contribute to it. Fantastic. Uh, back to what you were saying about not knowing where so many of the kids are. Um, what does that mean to the two educational advocacy programs that we have at CASA, the tutoring and the truancy? Yes, so uh, for those folks on the call who might be unaware, um, our tutoring and truancy programs are our two educational advocacy programs here at Advocates for Children CASA. And they are run by our educational liaison, Kim Diggs. Over the last few months, Kim has been working really hard with the volunteers from truancy and tutoring many of which I've seen on this call. So huge shout out to our educational advocacy volunteers. Uh, Kim and the volunteers have been working really hard to adapt to these new challenges um, in a way that specifically supports these kids' education. So uh, with truancy to start, we have seen a big uptick in referrals for kids to be involved in the truancy program here at CASA. Uh, mm -hmm. These are kids who were having a difficult time engaging in a classroom and now making those connections online is even more of a challenge. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what our volunteers have been working on is connecting with the school and teachers and the other resources who might be in this child's life and kind of working around this kid in a way to offer support. Uh, we've, we're met with a lot of challenges with overwhelmed parents and uh, frustrated kids and it is hard work right now. Um, with, our tu with our tutoring program, similar story, lots and lots of referrals for the tutoring program. Uh, as a reminder, or perhaps this might be new info to some folks on this call, our tutoring program is open to not only CASA kids, but also kids from the community who we receive referrals for. And across the board, we're getting referrals in for tutoring. So mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot in the works there. Um, 
I think it's really, it's really critical to note that foster children graduate high school at a lower rate than homeless children. And of course, foster children are a big percentage of the kids that we work with. So sadly, we knew that the odds were against our kids before this pandemic. And now tutoring and truancy are so, so important to help um, mitigate as many of these challenges as we can uh, mm -hmm. to keep giving our kids that chance that they deserve. That's such great information because I think unless as volunteers, we have kiddos that are in those programs, we really don't understand what goes on and how critical those programs are. Um, Amy, while we're hearing about those programs, uh, they're two of the newer ones. Tell us about the new cases that you're seeing in other programs. Yeah, thanks, Bev. As, Kim, as Andrea mentioned, we are keeping Kim really busy over the last couple of months and we're really grateful for all that she's doing. But yeah, we are seeing an increase in cases uh, across the board in our other programs as well. And Josefina briefly mentioned this, but the severity of the cases that we're seeing over the last several months has been much higher, much much more severe than we've seen in the past. And while we did see a dip in the number of what we call new filings, so those are new cases that have been uh, brought to the court that, and the court's been asked to be involved in those. In, in March and April, we saw a dip in some of those numbers, but we're back up and running, unfortunately, at the same numbers that we were seeing uh, pre-COVID and compared to this time last year. So our kids are, are coming back to our attention and we're, we're getting eyes on them again. Um, okay. But one of the challenges is, is, like I said, the cases are much more severe. Josefina mentioned that we're finding kids through uh, visits to the emergency room with severe cases of, of abuse and neglect there. We're seeing a lot of babies that are born drug exposed and with pretty high levels of, of drugs in their system, which is really challenging for withdrawals and just all sorts of different medical complications for those brand new babies. Um, we're getting seeing a lot of cases that are coming in through uh, 911 calls and police responding to homes with where there's domestic violence or there's arguments, some sort of contention or, or challenges there at the home that, that's bringing uh, the emergency personnel out to the home. And although we did see some cases start like this in the past, what we saw more of historically was uh, new cases that would come about because teachers were concerned and so they were calling in referrals or neighbors um, were seeing something in their neighborhood and, and calling and kids were getting involved in the system earlier on in, in mm -hmm. the life of the abuse and the neglect. And although we are still seeing some of those and the number of calls to the child abuse hotline are starting to increase more and we're getting back up to some of those pre-COVID numbers. We just have so many kids, like Andrea mentioned, that aren't in school, that aren't getting seen by neighbors or seen by family, friends, and teachers or seen by their pediatricians, just their normal doctors for check-ins. So by the time they're coming into specifically our dependency and neglect court cases, mm -hmm. the, the abuse and the neglect is just really, um, it's, it's escalated to a pretty heartbreaking, I mean, it's always heartbreaking, but just a really challenging place. And so our volunteers are having to jump in um, on cases that are more challenging than, than we've seen a lot in the past. Um, and, and so that's specifically for our dependency neglect cases. And we also have, we recently started appointing classes to juvenile delinquency cases. So those are cases in the criminal court system where, where youth have picked up a criminal charge. And um, we're getting a lot of referrals from our community partners for those juvenile delinquency cases. That, that program is still pretty small. We appointed our first CASA to that over to a juvenile delinquency case over the summer. But as word is spreading with our judicial officers and with the partners that we're working with, that we are appointing CASAs to those cases, we're getting more and more referrals for those youth that have picked up some sort of um, charge and are just needing additional support. And one thing that is, is interesting to see right now during COVID times with those new juvenile delinquency cases is those kids historically may have been put in juvenile, delin or in juvenile detention or in some sort of out of home facility um, because of the charges that they picked up. But due to COVID restrictions and such, the teams are really focusing on keeping those kids, those nonviolent offenders in their communities and in their homes. And that means that they're really looking for more supports for them. And so our classes on our juvenile delinquency cases are proving to be so essential in, in providing advocacy and helping the professional team see, see a different side of these kids that they may not have seen um, historically or with a lot of the other kids coming through the juvenile delinquency system. 
Mm -hmm. We also have a legacy program where we are able to provide our mentors for um, young adults who aren't necessarily involved in the juvenile delinquency system or in um, a dependency and neglect case. They may have no court involvement at all, which I love the legacy program because it allows us to expand that great work that our volunteers are doing to kids that aren't necessarily involved in the courts. Um, mm -hmm. So it provides that one-on-one -on -one mentorship and assistance with life skills and with budgeting and just learning, learning how to be a kid and, and young adult in the world and learning how to transition into adulthood. Um, but the challenge is, is that we, with all these wonderful programs there's, and all the amazing kids that we're able to work with, there's still a gap and there's still not enough volunteers to, to meet the needs and, um, of, of all the kids that are still out there. Well, Josefina, I have a question for you. <laughs> How do we close that gap? Yes, um, and, and this is again, I go back to what I started with, right? We belong to a wonderful community and that community has continued to just show up every time we've needed them. And we didn't really know what to expect when we were all thinking about COVID. We, we were used to doing our trainings in person. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm, kudos to Nancy, who I believe is also um, attending tonight. She um, is our training coordinator. And overnight, we were like, Nancy, we got to still train. We still got kids to serve. And she had to figure out an online platform. And here we were using Zoom and everything we could to still train our volunteers. And surprisingly, um, well, kind of surprisingly and kind of not, we know our community, our classes have been so big. Over the last three classes, we've had between 20 to 25 new volunteers participating. Oh, and and as, as Amy mentioned, you know, 59% sounds like, well, that's a pretty decent percentage. That's a little bit over half, but that still means 41% of our kids aren't being served. And as you heard mm -hmm. already um, in us kind of answering some of these questions, by the time the cases reach our office, they're the most difficult of difficult cases. Mm -hmm. And it means that <clears throat> all hands on deck. It means that we're part of a community that's trying to be solution-based, keep families together. But in order to do that, we need to invest in these families and provide support mm -hmm. systems. And cost is a big piece of that pie. Mm -hmm. um, so we're very, very happy to report that of the three classes, we did have between 20 to 25 attending each of those. Um, and, and we did pivot and got creative to, in order to do that. But it still means that we have a lot of work to do. We're nowhere close to that bridging that gap between the 41%. We're going to continue to work towards that. Um, so our next training class is gonna be hosted in January. We're doing CASA 101s now um, to get that prepared for January. Um, and then also we're really focusing on volunteer retention. We know that with COVID it's brought new challenges and our seasoned volunteers are that much more crucial to the work we do. We know mm -hmm. that the child welfare system is already complicated. Um, and so to have some of that experience in a time when things are so confusing is very, is a huge asset to our organization. So we've mm -hmm. continued to work on nurturing those relationships and supporting our volunteers to retain them. Um, mm -hmm. We know if they've taken one case, they can take that experience. And while every case is different, they know the system a little bit better. And so mm -hmm. um, we're working on continuing to do that. And then we recently just filled one of our new positions, which is a volunteer engagement and program support coordinator. And we're excited to get this person started up and running the first part of November and have them really focused on that recruitment as well as that continued retention. That's awesome. One thing that I would like to say to everyone who is listening, whether you're an active volunteer or not, talk up advocates for children to the people that you know. Tell them what we do, tell them how amazing it is to interact with these kids and their families. That's how we get volunteers. I know that's how I came to CASA. As I mentioned at the very beginning, I went to coffee with a friend and she was talking to me about the fact that my kids had just gone to college and I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. And she just said, I know what you should do and started telling me about a case that she had been on, how amazingly rewarding it was and what that work was like. And that's all it took. So I would encourage all of you listening, keep it at the forefront of your mind because 
we desperately need people to step up and go through training and take on a case. They don't all have to be icky and complicated. You can have your pick of cases that are out there. The staff is amazing as far as matching volunteers to the case that they're gonna take on. But I can't say enough as a volunteer about how amazing this work is. So my goodness, so much going on. Um, I can just imagine that this year has also impacted external relationships, meaning donors and community partners. What has that been like and how is it changing? Yes, yes, it has. Well, it will probably come as no surprise to hear that we did have to cancel or postpone four of our events that had previously been scheduled in 2020. We canceled our casino night, our rally for kids and our red wagon ball, and we had our Love and Summits event postponed. So that was a bummer for a lot of reasons. Um, obviously, we did not have that revenue coming into our budget, so that changes some things. Um, and it also came at a time where, as you've been hearing this whole conversation, we have so many needs. Our families are faced with so many challenges right now. So mm -hmm. luckily, we did have that COVID, CASA COVID Connections campaign back in April, which allowed us to meet about 90 to 100 needs, specific needs from our families. Um, and then most recently, in August, we launched our first ever entirely virtual fundraising event, Home Sweet Hope which uh, in looking at all these names tonight, so many of you participated mm -hmm. in Home Sweet Hope. It is amazing. It's yeah. making me excited to talk about again after seeing these names. Um, it was hugely successful. We had set a goal of raising $220,000 over the course of two weeks. With the help of over 450 donors, we raised over $260,000. So biggest <laughs> thank you to our network who just showed up over those the course of those two weeks. It was absolutely incredible. And we are so grateful. It makes me a little emotional to talk about. It. I mean, we were, we were, we did not know what to expect. So thank you. Um, it is really encouraging to see our network respond so positively to this virtual fundraiser because unfortunately virtual fundraising is probably going to be where we're at for the next foreseeable future for the next little mm -hmm. while. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a conversation we're actively having um, amongst our development team, amongst our board. What does fundraising look like? And while we could not be more excited or thankful for the success of Home Sweet Hope, Something that we're really aware of is that that $260,000 replaced the revenue that Red Wagon Ball would have brought in, mm -hmm. that one of those canceled events would have brought in. Yes. So we are still up against a big challenge. Um, and that's something that is, is very important to us and a huge priority of our development team and of our board. Um, I will note that while we're operating on a lean budget, we have not cut any corners when it comes to the service of our children and the CASA families and the support of our volunteers and staff. And I really hope every volunteer on this call would agree with that. Please contact us if you don't. Um, but I, that just, that's so special. Uh, we have not had any layoffs. We don't foresee that happening. Um, and we also are really proud to announce tonight that last fiscal year, 89% of every single dollar we brought in, 89 cents of every single dollar went directly to our programming and our children. That is so important to host Fina, myself, and Amy. That's so important mm -hmm. to our board. That is a absolute top priority of our fundraising moving mm -hmm. forward. Um, and I'm excited to share that tonight. And I think that is just so encouraging to all of our donors and community partners, everybody that supports advocates with their time and their dollars to know how well managed their dollars are when they are donated. That's incredible. Just to shift a little bit, um, I wanted to find out about continuing education opportunities for volunteers. What does that look like? I can take this one, Bev, and talk a little bit about continuing education. Thank you. That's a great question. So as we've talked about tonight, our cases have changed, and they look different now than what we had last year. And last year, they look different than the year before because the needs of our community and and our society and our culture is just always changing. And we 
we so value the 30 hours of training that our volunteers go through when they start a case. But like you mentioned, mm -hmm. you've been a volunteer for 15 years and it looks different. The 30 hours of training has changed. The cases have changed. The system mm -hmm. that we're working with is always evolving and always trying to improve. And we as staff are trying to provide that same support to our volunteers and help them um, be as best prepared as they can be for whatever they're, whatever's coming on their case and whatever they're uh, faced with. And, and I appreciate what you said earlier, Bev, that not all the cases are yucky and nicky and, and just really hard. I think we've highlighted today a lot of the challenges that, that we're facing, that our community is facing. Um, mm -hmm. But it's something that I find so important in talking with our volunteers. I know our staff have heard me say this before, is that it's so important that we go out and advocate for kids to be kids and for children to be children. And at the core of it, that's all these kids are is their kids. And they just want to have care and attention and, and just be seen for what they are. And so we really try to help our volunteers be in a position that they can do that, that they can be aware of what's going on on the case and aware of how to interact, best interact with the kids and advocate for the kids, uh, mm -hmm. but also be there just to show up for them. And so um, in the continuing education opportunities that, that we present, we try and have them be a wide variety because we know all the cases and all the kids look differently. Um, we require 12 hours of continuing ev education every year from our volunteers. And that's something that National CASA, we're, we're part of um, a national agency, and that's what they require. And that's something that we locally really support um, in because it provides us an opportunity to, um, to support our volunteers as well. So some of the recent continuing education opportunities that we've had that we've seen have, have um, been a need for our, for our volunteers in our community include things like suicide prevention. And so we've been able to have um, some really wonderful contacts from the depression center at CU, uh, the CU Denver campus to come in and talk with our volunteers about what to watch for, how to um, support their, their youth or their children if they're um, experiencing suicidal ideations and such. We talk about mm -hmm. self-care and vicarious trauma. We know what our CASAs see and what they experience can be challenging and we wanna make sure they're taking care of themselves. So we try and help provide techniques to be able to do that. Um, we recently were able to host a two-part continuing education series on courageous allyship and being able to have courageous conversations about, um, about social justice, about racial equity and how to support our kids in, in all that's going on in our society right now. Um, in addition to the other challenges of, challenges that they're facing. And so we really try and, again, meet the needs of, of what we're seeing in our community and, and be ever growing um, as, as we move forward with the work that we're doing and that our wonderful volunteers are doing. I understand the Courageous Allyship training was really well attended. Josefina, can you tell us a little bit more about what else Advocates is doing concerning social justice and equity. Yeah, absolutely. I think even before um, some recent things that have happened in the world, this has been an area we've always focused on here at Advocates for Children. Mm -hmm. um, as we started this town hall meeting, we, we talked a little bit about the diversity even within our judicial district. And what we acknowledge and what we know is the child welfare system that we work in, there's a lot of barriers of who can access resources and how long it takes to access some of those resources. Um, for example, we know there are some areas, some more affluent areas that have um, readily available to them, mental health um, uh, resources where some of our areas that are less affluent, there's a longer waiting list. And um, in addition to that, even when we moved for, to online um, school at the beginning of our pandemic, what we recognized is there was a lot of assumptions that were made in pivoting to this. And quickly what we identified, and you heard a little bit about the laptops that were provided for our families, not only the laptops, but also access to Wi-Fi. And then also recognizing that many of our families weren't used to having two or three kids at home and feeding mm -hmm. them breakfast and lunch. And, and so, so many assumptions on what our families were capable of doing were revealed during this difficult time. And that's when our organization truly pivoted. And I am proud to lead an organization that is so invested in giving back to our mission and directly to that mission. Um, and what we did is, is provide some additional resources, um, both within families and then also connecting and, and identifying the gaps of services in our community and working with our community partners to help bridge those gaps. 
we mm -hmm. know that we, we aren't the jack of all trades, but what we do really well is we're a connector. We identify where are their gaps and who is able to provide this and what do we need to do to make sure that our families and our children are supported. And so that has been a huge focus of what we've done over the last several months and we're gonna continue to do. Um, even as things start to open up, we recognize that, that those issues don't go away. It's only given us an opportunity to really highlight it and work that much harder at bridging the gaps. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing I can say is we love our kids. Mm -hmm. We really do. It, it just fills my heart that the volunteers, the staff of advocates really does they, they love all of the kids that we have a responsibility to, that we are coming alongside to represent. And this isn't anything new. And I think that's what's so amazing. It may be more focused, but it isn't anything new. This has been going on at Advocates for a very long time. Um, let's shift focus a little bit and talk about what's coming up. What do you see in the next several months ahead of us? Well, there's, a, there's a lot coming up. And as we all know, the next couple of months are just a busy time uh, in, in general for all families. Um, with the holidays coming up, we know um, the election day and, and all of the pieces and the conversations that are surrounding that. And so it's a hard time of year. And, mm -hmm. and we know that it's particularly hard for, excuse me, for our kids that the holidays can be a time where it's reach where they're re-experiencing trauma that they've had in the past or re-experiencing re challenging holidays. So regardless of what their situation, it can just be a challenging time. They may um, may not have gifts. They may not have um, be able to be with their family. And so we really try and provide as much support as we can for our kids and our families during this time. Um, mm -hmm. And we love this time at the office because we get to provide. Thanksgiving baskets, which is a really wonderful opportunity that we can provide the, the non-perishable goods for the families. And hopefully lots mm -hmm. of volunteers on here have been able to take those baskets to their families in years past. And it's, I had the opportunity last year to deliver a Thanksgiving basket to a family. And the mother was just so appreciative and grateful for mm -hmm. a big basket full of all sorts of things. And uh, so we do those Thanksgiving baskets coming up. We will be doing our holiday gift drive and where we can provide gifts to to the kids that we work with um, and personalized gifts and, and mm -hmm. looking for what, you know, trying to provide them what, what they're wanting and, and what they're asking for. Um, mm -hmm. We have um, a coat drive that we're gonna be doing to provide some coats for some kiddos. Uh, there's just a lot coming for the types of uh, services and the supplies that we can provide our kids right now. And if you haven't, if you're a volunteer and you're on this, call and you haven't had a chance to fill out the request for the um, for the Thanksgiving baskets, the gifts, we have some Christmas trees that are available this year. All of those, oh. uh, those links can be found on our website and you can just fill out the forms. We try to streamline our process. Some of you may have been here for years and we've gone through all sorts of different processes to, to get that information, but this year we've been able to streamline it. It's all there on our website. So we really encourage you to to jump on the website and fill that, that information so we can provide those pieces to, to the families that you're working with. Um, some other things that we have coming down, down, the, um, down the line for us, we are, I'm really excited to talk about this. Josefina and, and myself and, and Maggie, our continuum of services manager, have been talking a lot recently about a housing program that mm -hmm. we're trying to get up and running. We know that <clears throat> right now is a big challenge that a lot of people in our communities are facing. And, and young adults that transition out of foster care, that emancipate out of the um, child welfare system are at a really, really high risk to be, mm -hmm. to be homeless. And so we're working with some other programs, some other CASA programs in the state and some wonderful supporters and sponsors to create a program that we can provide some of those resources for, for youth that are transitioning out of foster care. So stay tuned on that. We're still awesome. at the very early stages, um, but are really excited about the, all the potential that that program holds. Um, and then another exciting thing is we are hiring a case coordinator right now. So if you're interested oh. and uh, want to look into joining our Advocates for Children family, that is also, that job description is also posted on our website. Um, and we actually have, um, as Andrea said, we haven't had to do any layoffs and we're really excited to be able to 
Um, welcome two additional team members to our staff, actually, that I believe they're both here on the call. So shout out to Taylor awesome. and Ben, they're both here. We're excited for them to be starting and joining our CASA family. So if you're interested in that, uh, come check out our website for more information on that job posting. That's fantastic. So the dates of the coat drive are on the website? Yep, all the information that you need should Good. be on there. If not, Jack Cregan, our um, development coordinator, is well-versed and he's had a couple years under his belt of running all of these pieces. So Jack is very knowledgeable right. and can provide that information. We can stick Jack's email in the chat box as well. So if you have any questions, you can reach out directly to him. Awesome. Last but not least, Andrea, what are the ways that our community partners and the people that have come around Advocates for Children, how can they be supportive of CASA? Well, like Amy mentioned, we got a lot of stuff going on, which means we need a lot of support right now. Um, we This is such a wonderful time of year to either get engaged with Advocates or to even become more involved than you already are because of the opportunities that we have right now. We always mm -hmm. tell people, if you're interested in becoming involved with advocates, we'll find the place for you. All you have to do is reach out and, and we'll take it from there. Um, we have a lot of community partners who are sponsoring families, sponsoring gifts, uh, sponsoring drives and collections. So if anybody on this call, either personally or your family or your company, want to be a partner or a donor in one of those ways, we'd love to talk to you. Um, we've got a lot of folks, Comcast, Unlock the PPO, Parker Performing Arts, Centennial Rotary Club, um, tons of awesome, awesome donors, and so many others, Lone Tree Dental. We have dental kits, we haven't even mentioned that. Um, so we got a lot of stuff going on. So please keep that in mind and just know that there's a lot of ways to support right now. And then, um, of course, we have our Colorado Gives Day coming up on Tuesday, December 8th. For those that might not be familiar, Colorado Gives Day is a statewide giving holiday or giving yeah. day, we think it's a holiday, uh, where a portion of the donations that are made that day are matched by First Bank. So please mark your calendars for December 8th. You'll be seeing stuff come out from us about that. Um, and then last but not least, we have a new volunteer training that will be kicking off in January. We have CASA 101s, I think, I think Josefina um, mentioned that earlier in this call. We've got some CASA 101s leading up to that training, which is a requirement for any new volunteer. So I believe November 13th is our next 101. Um, so please reach out if you might be interested in, if anybody on this call is not already a volunteer, if you're interested in becoming a volunteer, or if you have somebody in your life who you think would make a great volunteer, if you've got a Bev in your life who you recently <laughs> sat down with and is looking for some ways to fill their time. We've got some ideas about that. So keep that in mind, please. Fantastic. We have a few questions that have come through that we would like to answer and everybody feel free uh, to chime in and add whatever you feel is important. Uh, the first one is what kinds of gifts and things can volunteers provide for their kids, especially around the holidays? Good That's question. a great question. <laughs> Amy, I'm looking at you. I think this is oh, Amy written on it. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can talk about this one. Thank you. Okay. So I want to start by saying we actually have Maggie, who I mentioned before, our continuum of services manager, has been working hard to put together a guide for our volunteers on, on gift giving and some things to look for, some things to maybe avoid in looking at when shopping for gifts for our volunteers or for the kiddos, excuse me. Um, so that hopefully you'll, all of our volunteers on the call, on the call will be getting that from their case coordinator in the next couple of weeks. So you can watch for that. Um, mm -hmm. Some things that, that we know our kids love are really, it comes down to what they're looking for, personalized gifts. For our kids that have been in the foster care system for a while or have been moving around from house to house, they may get hand-me-down gifts, they may get some generic gifts, um, mm -hmm. even some of our other community partners who they may be getting gifts for, they may not be personalized. And that's something that we really pride ourselves on, are really finding out what our kids want. So yes. there's, that's not a very specific answer because it really varies depending on the kiddo. So what I'd suggest mm -hmm. is talking to them, seeing what they're interested in, but being realistic about the gifts. One thing mm -hmm. that we talk with our volunteers about a lot is not wanting to create unrealistic expectations for our kids because our mm -hmm. volunteers, uh, we want them to come in and we want the kids, we want our volunteers to be able to really focus on um, 
providing some supports for the kids, but not something that we can't replicate year after year. Or if their parents, if they're at home providing big expensive gifts, that's going to be hard for the parents in the future to mm-hmm. be able to replicate that again. So having conversations with whoever the kiddo is or the young person is placed with to see what they feel comfortable with having in their home is always really important. <coughs> um, keeping in mind things like the kid's safety and what their specific needs are, what their specific concerns on the case may be. So it's mm-hmm. really having conversations with the case coordinator. They know the case nearly as well as the CASAs do. And then uh-huh. the other professionals, like the guardian of items or the caseworkers to see what's most appropriate for the kids at this time. Mm-hmm. I agree. Any, anything else? Any other input? I agree with what you said. I think one of, one of the greatest temptations is to do too much, go too big. And that is just something we have to rein ourselves in and realize that that's probably not appropriate because we can accomplish what we want to with simplicity and with things that really mean something to the individual child. And it's really just getting to know them and what's important. Uh, One of my uh, kids that I've just had uh, loves Pokemon cards. No big deal. He is absolutely thrilled. If he gets five Pokemon cards, yippee. I'm so, so happy to hear that Pokemon cards are still a thing. That's awesome. I guess, I guess they are. He's <laughs> sick, so. <laughs> That's you fantastic. Can, yeah, it is. Um, second question. Uh, what are some of the more rewarding and hardest things for our volunteers? Oh my goodness, how much time do we have? Um, the re- I can tell you something very simple with how rewarding It is to be a CASA and I'm going to, I know I'm going to lose it. Um, The kids that I have had most recently, six years old and 16, uh, they've had a very rough life. Uh, They have had very irresponsible uh, bio parents. And when I had a conversation with them about how they felt about the foster home that they are in now, which Uh, wants to adopt them. The comment was, we really like it here. We don't have to worry where we're going to sleep at night or if we'll have food to eat the next day. That is as basic as it gets for us as volunteers to make sure that our kids are taken care of to make sure that they are in safe environments. Their expectations are typically not really high. Wanting to know that they're safe when they go to sleep, that they have a roof to sleep under and food to eat. I have heard that more than once from my CASA kids. Mm. So when you can know that you are an integral part of making sure they're safe, that's rewarding. Uh, the hardest thing, oh my goodness, there are a lot. And, you know, I would never sugarcoat being a CASA. There are a lot of hard things. And uh, part of that is seeing what they've come from and wanting to rush in and make it all better. But that's not what we do. We don't rush in and take over, but we oversee and make sure that the, the GAL and the caseworker are aware of everything they need to be aware of. We make sure that the home that they are in is appropriate. And um, those can be hard. You can encounter situations where you just have to take the bull by the horns and have the conversations you need to have with the GAL or with the caseworker and make sure those kids are in a safe and loving environment. Um, anything else that you guys would like to add? You said that beautifully. Yeah, <laughs> the loaded question. So <laughs> yeah, it's, I think that's really well said, Bev. It, it really, it, it does tug at your heart for sure, but that's a good thing. We are connected to our kids. And um, the next question is what makes a good CASA? And I think one of the big things for me is being vested in the lives of these children and yet knowing that line to not personalize what they are going through. 
uh, we are there as an advocate. We are not there as their parent. And we're, we're not there really as their best friend. We're there as someone for them to count on, someone that they know will not leave them. Throughout the, the expanse of their case, that is the one thing that we can say as CASAs, barring being moved or dying, we are there for them and we will be the constant in their life. They can count on it. And that brings them so much peace that brings them a confidence that they need because very often these kids have been taken out of the only home they know, good, bad, or ugly. That's the only home they know. So we need to be that person who will stand with them, stay in touch with them, get to know them, and let them know if anything comes up, I'm your go-to. Absolutely. That's so well said, Bev. When I think about that question, I'm I'm looking at who's on this call and so many mm -hmm. names that are popping in my mind of wonderful causes are those of you who are listening right now. And I think uh, it really, it comes down to getting to know these kids as kids. And that's been a theme that we've, we've spoken about for the last 45 minutes. These kids mm -hmm. are kids and getting to yeah. know them as individuals and, and hearing mm -hmm. our volunteers tell us their, you know, what their kid loves, what their kid doesn't love. I just, I'm always amazed and really encouraged and inspired to hear how well our volunteers know these kids. And that just mm -hmm. kind of sounds like a silly statement, but it's so true. Our, mm -hmm. the, the bond that is built when you just, you just see these kids as children. And I think that that's, um, that's one of the most special things our volunteers can do for their kids. Mm -hmm. um, along with everything you mentioned, I think that's a really, you really hit the nail on the head with that, Bev. Uh, let's, let's try one more. Uh, we have a, about seven or eight minutes left in trying to stay within our hour allotment. Uh, the question is, what are the parents like? Do you have to work with them? And is that scary? Mm. Uh, can be. <laughs> I can maybe tackle this. My power went out. So I'm sorry I disappeared oh. for a moment. <laughs> Oh <laughs> Gotta love technology, right? Um, and I, I, since Amy and Andrea probably had to tackle a couple of questions while I was gone, um, I'll go ahead and start this. And, and Amy and Andrea, please feel free to jump in. Um, what I'll say is that we meet families where they are. And at Advocates for Children, we do that without judgment. We recognize when a child can be reunited with their family, they have the most, uh, they have the better outcomes. And so what we do is we approach a situation and try to um, identify those areas of opportunity, not weaknesses, but areas of opportunity, and also mm -hmm. build on those strengths. And again, as I kind of mentioned earlier, bridging those gaps and connecting families with resources and helping them to be stronger. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's a huge focus of what we do. So when, when you ask, you know, do you work with the, with the parents and is that scary? Um, absolutely, we're, we're, we work with parents. And what mm -hmm. we know to be true is people don't just wake up in the morning wanting to abuse their children. There's something that has happened, whether it's mm -hmm. a generational cycle, whether it's a lack of um, coping mechanisms. And, and so rather than that judgment piece, we come with resources and solutions and really work towards making sure that children's, children can be safe in the environment that they're in. And there are very, there are times that that doesn't work out the way we would like, but we're going to do everything we can to try before mm -hmm. we, we recognize or, or we get to a place where it doesn't make sense for a child to be reunited. Um, mm -hmm. And we work really closely with our professional partners. And that in, includes our respondent parent councils. I mean, I even have a board member, I, I think she's on the call, um, Hillary, who's been on our board for a long time. She's an RPC. She represents the parents. And, mm -hmm. and that's just important to see things from different lenses to be able to get to a solution that makes sense for these children. Amy, yes. Andrea, I don't know if you wanted to add to that also. I, that was wonderful. The only additional piece that I was thinking about is that we always have to keep in mind that our parents have, have gone through their own, their own experiences and their own past. Mm -hmm. And Josefina, you mentioned this, that they don't wake up and say, today's the day that I'm going to hurt my child. But there's other pieces that they're working through and that they, um, other challenges that they're facing in other places of their life as well. So we really try and provide that support, knowing, like you said, Josefina, that the kids 
really at the end of the day, if there's a way they can be with their parents and be safe with their parents, that's going to create the best outcome for the children and really for our society as a whole. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, I have a tiny little story I want to tell you all about dealing with a very scary parent and how good it turned out because uh, the family that I had, their mom was a member of the Crips. And I am little white bread Bev from St. Louis, Missouri, who grew up in, you know, the little track homes. And what did I know about games, right? Nothing. So uh, she was in the home and then she was arrested and put in prison. And I took the kids to visitation to see her. That meant everything to her. And we actually had an amazing relationship because she knew I wanted the best for her kids. And where if I had met her on the street, it, it just would have scared me to death. But I got to see her differently. She was a mom who made some really, really bad choices but she was able to look at me as a CASA and say, you're really taking care of my kids. Yes, I am. And I will continue to until this case comes to a close. It, it was just the most unexpected relationship that developed between her and me. And I not only took her kids to see her in prison in Denver, but she was transferred down to Pueblo. And I took the kids down there to see her, to have a visit. It just, it meant the world to her. So you learn as a CASA to try to work through the difficult circumstances that are in front of you and realize I'm here for these kids. They wanted to see their mom. I took them to see their mom. And it actually worked out amazingly well. So there are just a lot of circumstances and and I I have to plug case coordinators because I'll tell you what <laughs> they are full of wisdom and good advice. And when you get in a difficult situation, that's who you call and you talk through it and figure out what the best solution is. So um, we are just about out of time. Uh, Josefina, would you like to wrap us up with your final thoughts for this very first ever town hall meeting? Yes. First, I just want to thank you, Bev. When we were brainstorming this, um, we the first person and the only person that came to mind to moderate this was you. Um, you thank you. Huge support of our organization in so many ways. You mentioned early on the golf tournament and a volunteer and all those pieces that are so important. Um, but I also want to take the opportunity, we have a variety of people on the call today between volunteers, board members, and supporters. And I've said this a couple of times, and I can't say it enough. Um, coming from a, no. a child who's oh, been in the system, I'll tell you, it comes <laughs> Am I, am I back? You're good, you're back. You jumped out for a second. <laughs> yeah, <good>. Technology. <laughs> so what I'll say is just coming, I'll wrap it up. It's probably telling me to shut up, Josefina. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you just coming from this walk of life that I don't know where I'd be today if I didn't have that, that consistent adult who invested in me. And so the difference you all are making, whether it's a board member, a supporter, or a volunteer, it goes a long way because today I'm sitting in front of you as executive director of Advocates for Children CASA, but if it wouldn't have been a consistent adult who invested in me, I don't know where I'd be. And it takes a community. It's, I know it's mm -hmm. very cliche to say it takes a village. It's true. It's all of us leaning in and helping one another rather than just staying within our own circle and look, looking at our own situation. So mm -hmm. just wanting to send a huge thank you to our community. I, on behalf of all of the directors, we miss the connection. So this is the closest we could get to a connection. <laughs> thank you so much, everybody who attended tonight and, and look yes. forward to more of these. 